Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Schreiber, a postdoc at Stanford, and today I'll be giving a presentation on navigating the pitfalls of applying machine learning in genomics. Most of my research has involved applying machine learning to large genomic datasets. During the research process, I've sometimes inadvertently made mistakes. Fortunately for my reputation, I'm not the only one. A number of reviews and perspectives have come out warning about various challenges in properly applying machine learning to specific domains, including healthcare, plant biology, as well as more generally to genomics at large. The common thread among these pieces, and my personal experience, is that applying machine learning in practice is much more challenging than some may initially expect. If only there was a word to describe those challenges. So, a few years ago, I started a conversation with Katie Pollard and Sean Whelan at the Gladstone Institute. Unsurprisingly, it turns out that they had thoughts on this very topic. As a side note, if you happen to have a chance to work with either of them, I would highly recommend it. They're great collaborators. Bill is okay too, I suppose. Anyway, our common experience was that perhaps the biggest issue in applying machine learning to genomics datasets is that the primary consequence of falling into one of these pitfalls is that rather than getting an error message, you observe very good performance. Because people generally want their models to work, sometimes they're not as skeptical about good performance as they should be. We identified five statistical pitfalls that we see people sometimes fall into, and have written a review piece that will hopefully be coming out soon uh, describing those pitfalls. So, the first one is failing to account for distributional differences between the training, test, and prediction set. I'll get to what the, the prediction set is in a second. Sort of a canonical example of distributional differences in genomic data sets comes from different batches in single cell data. You may, may get data that looks something like this. We each of the different batches or experiments that you collected your data from, despite coming from the same underlying uh, phenotype, like the same cell type or tissue, etc., exhibits different distributional differences, as you can see here. Uh, consequently, there are tons of people who have uh, made different methods for normalizing this type of data, trying to account for these distributional differences and making it so that if you have the same underlying biology, you exhibit the same uh, characteristic, the same distribution. However, if, regardless of if you're developing methods to try and do this type of normalization, or if you're, doing, if you're developing a method that would downstream use this data, like building a machine learning method that uses normalized data, sometimes we see people incorrectly partition their data. For example, let's say that you have all of your cells across all of your batches, and you use cross-validation in order to randomly assign them to your training in a test set like this, where you've assigned data from your batches 1, 2, 3. You get great performance, and you publish your paper at a high-tier journal. Everything looks amazing. Then your collaborator comes, and they have data from a new batch. And so this enters the prediction set. The prediction set is how you would expect to use your model outside the context of your primary cross-validation, basically outside the context of your paper, how would other people use your model. So they have a new batch of data, and they try using your model, and they find that they do not get nearly as good performance as you reported in your paper on their batch of data. Why is this? Well, it's kind of simple. Basically, when you did your cross-validation, that your, your training set had examples from all the three batches, all the batches in the test set, but they didn't have any examples from their batch in the training set, and so your model wasn't evaluated on how well it could generalize the new batches. Essentially, the reason is that the relationship between the training and the test set is not the same as the relationship between the training and the prediction set. So the resolution here is that your training and test set should have the same uh, relationship as the training and the prediction set. If you're expecting that your method will be used on new batches that you haven't yet observed, then your test set should be held out batches that is not in your training set. Even though single cell data is kind of the canonical example, there are more subtle ways that distributional differences can occur in genomics data. We recently finished the ENCODE imputation challenge. This was basically a challenge where people were provided with ChIP-seq, DNA-seq, and ATT&CK-seq data from around 180 different experiments and had to impute the held out ones. You can see the training, the validation, and the testing sets here. I'm not going to get too much into the details because that doesn't matter as much, but you can see some of the results from the challenge here, two of the tracks that they were being imputed. In blue, we have the experimental signal from two ataxic tracks. In green, we have Avocado's results, which are a baseline method I developed last year. And in orange, we have the average activity, which is not a machine learning method, but just a basic aggregation. Then we have the top three challenge performers. You can see that it seems like everyone's doing pretty well, that they're getting the general shape of the attack seek uh, data down right. But if you look at the precise signal values, you can see that there's something going on. Specifically, you can see that the 
experimental signal is exhibiting high values, whereas the predicted signal, even from the baseline methods, is much lower. What's going on here? Why, why is everything systematically underpredicting the signal? Well, it turns out that there's a huge distributional difference between the training and the test set. Let's take a look at H3K4ME3, which was the worst offender. Here, we've extracted all of the peaks in the training set and all the peaks from the test set, and we've created a CDF of the average signal in the peaks. You can see that the distributions do not line up at all. Basically, at around, uh, at around a signal strength of 100, the 50% of the peaks in the test set signal exhibit a signal strength higher than 100, whereas only around 15% of the peaks in the training set. If you get to a signal strength of around you know, 300, that less than 1% of peaks in the training set exhibit um, a signal strength above that, whereas over 20% of peaks in the test set. If you do a more sophisticated evaluation where you extract the peaks from each experiment and calculate the Komarov smirnov statistic between each one of them, which basically measures how different the distribution is, you can see that the experiments in the training set are fairly similar to each other. The experiments in the test set are very similar to each other, but the experiments um, between the training and the test set are very dissimilar from each other, suggesting that there's a huge distributional shift. Is it fair to evaluate these models on data that has exhibited a huge distributional shift? Uh, shift like that. This isn't something that just relates to ENCODE or just relates to the ENCODE imputation challenge. Anytime you use a data set that has data collected over a large period of time, then you may experience these types of effects. Basically, as data quality improves over time, you may see differences in uh, the distribution of the signal related to this improvement in quality. The second pitfall relates to dependency structure among examples. Basically, imagine that you have a bunch of proteins. Proteins from the same family are probably going to be similar to each other. But if you take your data in like most machine learning practitioners do, where it's just a table, where each row is a different example, each column is a different feature, you may ignore the dependency structure between these different examples. So frequently what you'll see is that maybe you do cross-validation with your proteins. You have some proteins from the same family in your training set, some proteins from that family in the test set, and you observe fairly good performance. Now someone goes to use your method and applies it to a totally new protein family, and they observe much worse performance. That's not going to be good. Your, your method may not do nearly as well on that set. And so if you are trying to generalize to entirely new protein families, in this case protein families, but it could be anything, it could be uh, other things that have dependency structures are things like different isoforms from the same gene or different promoter enhancer interactions that share the same promoter or share the same enhancer. If you don't do this partitioning correctly, you may risk getting an overly optimistic estimate of your performance. So keep in mind what the prediction set of your method is. How do you expect somebody to use your method in practice? The third is the third pitfall we identified are confounding variables. This is a particularly difficult pitfall uh, to diagnose and specifically to account for. The idea is basically that sometimes there's an external variable that you haven't measured that induces a relationship between two observed, uh, two observed variables. For instance, imagine that you have a genetic variant that seems to quite clearly cause an increase in the gene expression. You can see on the left-hand side here that when you have a C at a position, you observe much higher gene expression than any of the other variants. But you can't figure out how that variant biologically causes an increase in gene expression. It's not in a promoter. It's not in an enhancer. It's not in a you know, transcription factor binding site or anything like that. It's just totally random. Well, you may not be accounting for ancestry. In this case, what we see is that you have, if you have four different ancestries, that one of the ancestries, which happens to have a mutation of that C, can much more cleanly explain the increase in gene expression. At this point, you might be wondering, well, like, what is ancestry? That's not really a concrete concept. The idea here is that ancestry uh, refers to some position along the phylogenetic tree that may cause some mutations in order to correlate with other mutations. It's not the fact that this particular population has a C at that position, is that individuals who have a C at that position may have a whole host of other genetic changes, and those are the ones that explain gene expression. And so if you fail to account for the ancestry of the different populations that occur in your samples, you may inadvertently find some mutations which are just along for the ride with the actual driver mutations. So the next pitfall is kind of my favorite. This is information leakage between the train and the test set. This can be actually be the most consequential one and the one where you can see the most inflated performance. The idea is sometimes 
uh, you'll see a method described that they'll take their data and they'll apply pre-processing steps to the entire data set. These can be things like normalizations, scalings, feature extractions, feature engineering, that type of thing. And then subsequently, they'll split their data into a training set and a test set. This can be very bad because what you're doing is you're transforming values of your training set according to values in the test set. If you're tra if you're transforming your values in the training set based on labels in the test set, this can be very, very bad as we'll see in a second. The correct thing to do is instead to take your data set, divide it into your training data and your test data, and then fit all of your pre-processing steps, your scalings, your, your feature selections, etc., using that and apply that separately to your training data and to your test data. That way you're not using any of your test data in order to transform values in your training data. You're only using the training data to transform everything else. So an example that I like to use that's been fairly popular on Twitter involves taking entirely random data. Uh, this can show you how bad this information leakage can actually be. So I'm going to show you some code just to, you know, cement how awful this can be with, you know, how simple a mistake it can be. Imagine you generate entirely random numbers. This is a matrix where you have entirely Gaussian random values and your labels are binary random values. No associations at all. There's no hidden signal at all. Then what you do is you select the top 200 features according to their correlation with the labels. So you take the top 200 features that um, in your data set that correlate with the labels across both your eventual training and your test set. Then you divide your data into your training and uh, test set. You run cross-validation on this. And you can see the logistic regression model on totally random data is able to achieve a performance of 0.9, basically get 90%, almost 91% accuracy. How is this possible? Well, it's quite simple. There are some features that just due to random, because of random noise in the data are going to correlate somewhat well with the label set, not perfectly, but just somewhat well. And so you can see here that as you, if you do this incorrectly, like in the red line, that as you increase the number of features, you get better and better performance up into a certain point. At this point, you basically got in all of the features that are going, that are correlating with the labels. And then you start to do increasingly poorly again. But if you perform this correctly, where you first split your data into a training and test set, and then you apply your pre-processing steps as normal, the gray line, you can see on this random data, you get basically random performance as you should. Keep in mind, you should not be getting better than random performance on entirely random data, but you can see here that you're getting much better than random performance based on having leaked information. Make sure that you're not doing this because it would be, you know, you can see how easy it is to inadvertently make this mistake and appear to get really good performance. So the final one, the final pitfall relates to unbalanced data. And kind of classically, people talk about balanced and unbalanced data in, the, uh, in terms of classification tasks. You have multiple categories that are your labels, and one of those is more prevalent than the others. The pitfall, uh, sometimes people talk about, you know, instead of using accuracy, you should use area under the OOC or area under the PR curve, which is correct, but that's not the pitfall. The pitfall is that you should make sure that your test set is the same as your prediction set. If you are... If you are planning on using your method genome-wide, you should not use a balanced test set. In this case, it's incorrect to use a balanced test set uh, to you know, artificially balance your test set and report performance on that. It doesn't matter so much what your training set is. You can use a balanced training set, you can use an unbalanced training set, but you should make sure that your test set represents the full set of data that you'd like to see. However, and balanced, uh, this problem of, of, of imbalance isn't just on classification tasks, it's also on regression tasks. So this can actually be a little bit more insidious because I've noticed that people don't quite have the, they, they don't quite know how to describe this properly in terms of the regression setting. So imagine this, this is in the context of imputing genomic data from my avocado paper. If you have total RNA-seq minus strand here on the top, you can see that the signal goes from 0 to 2.5 in blue, and then we have the imputations in the baseline. On the bottom, we have a satellation data, which goes from 0 to 5. There are two reasons that this data is imbalanced. The first is that the maximum signal value for the RNA-seq data is much lower than the acetylation data. The second is that it's much sparser. There are far more exact zeros along the genome than the acetylation data. And so if your method is trained to impute, you know, if your method is trained to predict multiple tracks in the imputation setting, in the multitask setting, then it's going to focus on the tracks with the higher average signal value. And so this is the first problem, that your method is going to focus on optimizing the tracks with the higher average signal value because those are the ones that comprise most of the loss. 
And then when you evaluate it, it looks like here that avocado is doing much better than the average activity when you aggregate over all the tracks. But if you break this down by assay, what you can see is that avocado is doing much better on most of the you know, histone modification and transcription factor experiments here, that the RNA-seq, the transcription experiments, make up such a small portion of the total error that it doesn't really matter if avocado is doing better or not. Avocado could be doing so much worse here than the baseline methods, and we wouldn't care if we just looked at the total error. So I want to emphasize that this isn't that avocado is doing anything wrong. We didn't do anything incorrect here. It's just that we may obscure some of the smaller tracks in a multitask setting when we have tracks that have various means. And so you want to make sure that uh, you're not excluding the, you're, you're not basically ignoring the tracks that have smaller values in favor of the ones that have a much higher average signal va value. So we focused on five pitfalls here. The first is distributional differences between train test and prediction sets, then dependency structure among examples, confounding variables, information leakage between the train and the test set, and finally unbalanced data. I'd like to thank my collaborators for working on this project. I really enjoyed having a chance to actually think in depth about what these pitfalls were and trying to explain them to others. And thank you for listening.